Amen. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, when I was growing up, I was not raised in a Christian home. I was raised, uh, in, it was not necessarily secular, but it wasn't born again Christian. However, my mom used to say something to me. Now, my mom later on got saved later in life, but she used to say something to me that is absolutely from what we're going to be talking about today. You can do whatever you put your mind to. You can do whatever you put your mind to. I grew up not being put down. I grew up not having a parent tell me all the reasons why I could not do a dream or a desire of my heart. I grew up with a parent telling me, you know, my dad, he, was, he, he didn't have the kind of uh, words of wisdom for me, he would, but he was there and he was supportive. But my mom is the one that would say, you can do whatever you put your mind to. She was encouraging me to reach beyond myself in the small town that I was raised in and to do something great. Later on, when I was in high school, you all remember substitute teachers. In fact, Laverne, who's on with us, was a substitute teacher for a while. Do you remember when the substitute teacher would come into the classroom and everybody, and you knew they were there just there for one day for one class and everybody was like, aha, are we going to have some fun? Well, there was one substitute teacher, I don't remember his name, but he made an impact on my life because he started by saying, now, I know that you're all thinking that, you know, this is going to just be a waste of time because I'm the substitute and you're just going to have a good, but I'm going to tell you something. He said, close your books. It's not in your book. I'm going to speak to you from my heart. And he began to tell us how we could do anything we wanted to do and that we did not have to be limited by what other people say. And he gave examples, like he gave an example of that he wanted to go to college, but he didn't have money for college. And so uh, he decided that if he worked, he could work his way through. And he found, a, he found a job, totally unqualified for the job. It was some sort of a, something that he worked in the maintenance of some gigantic building, and he had to monitor all of the, all of the, uh, the, the dials and, and things in there. Anyway, he said, what do I need? He called the place. What do I need to get this job? And they said, well, you need to have a steam fitters uh, certification. And he said, where do I get that? And they told him where to get that. So he went to the library. Now, some of you may not know what a library is. A library is a big place. They have lots of books. And books, you may not know what a book is. A book is something that you open up. It has pages in it, and you read it. You know, I, I mean, we're, reading, we're raising a generation that this is, all their books are here. And uh, nothing wrong with a book being there, but I still like, I'm old-fashioned. I still like a good book that I can hold. Anyway, so... Um, he got a book on steam fitter and all this stuff, and he studied, and he learned just enough to get the certification. And he had this job all the way while he was in college. He worked all night long by himself, watching all the dials and all of the, the, the meters in this building in a warm, well-lit area where he could study because he didn't have to interface with people, didn't have to answer the phone, and he did all of his studying there and so basically he said he was paid to study. And he aced college and he paid for everything in college and he just said, if you don't know how to do something, get a book and learn it. Well, I'm here to tell you this morning, we've got the book to learn whatever we need to do in life, in every area of life. For second, first Corinthians chapter two, verse nine. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love them, him. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Now, we know this. What we need to know is revealed by the Spirit. The important things of life, the important things of the Word, the important things of ministry revealed by the Spirit to our spirit. However, we must move it from our spirit to our mind. Because if we are to believe, it is not just believing in the heart, it's also believing in the mind. Otherwise, we are going to spend half our time in a battle between the mind and the spirit, the mind and the heart. We are going to be arguing internally, whether we can, whether we can't, whether we should, whether we shouldn't, whether we're able or not able. And we will not do anything because we're going to be embroiled in this internal battle and eventually give up and not do anything. We are to be able to think 
correctly by thinking the positive, powerful, fully equipped thinking of God. Jesus never met a person he couldn't change, never met a circumstance he couldn't win or overcome, never had a question he couldn't answer. He never saw anything impossible. He saw all things possible through him, the Lord, our Father, our Spirit, our Heavenly Spirit. Now, Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7, you know this verse, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. However, looking at that in the Hebrew, that's not what it says. What it says, as he thinketh in his nephesh, nephesh, the Hebrew word, not for heart, which is lev, but for mind, for being. What the word of God is saying is we've got to bring our mind under control. As we think we are, if we think we're a failure, we're going to fail. If we think we can, we can. If we think we're able, we'll, we're able. Now, there may be a struggle, but it's that thought life that's going to carry us through that struggle. That's going to press forward when every fiber in our physical being wants to give up. It's that thought life that we can, we can do this, we got this, that is going to keep us going forward in the face of defeat. And we're going to shake off defeat like Paul shook off the serpent and go forward for victory in Jesus' name. Let's see how to do that. Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Let's look at Abraham. Romans chapter 4. Now, I always use Romans chapter 4 for the heart and for faith. We're going to bypass that today. We've been talking about that a lot lately. What we want to look at is his mind. The working of Abraham's mind is mentioned several times here, starting in verse 19. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. The considering not was in his mind. The considering not was not faith. The faith was in what God could do, what God would do, what God said he'd do. The considering not is the mind. We consider our weakness more than we consider God's strength. We consider our inability more than we consider God's ability. We consider our past more than we consider the future God has for us. Considered not. He was able to bypass that thought life by his faith. But that's not the only place. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. He staggered not. Now, unbelief would be in the heart. But the staggering would be in the mind. You see, the mind can convince the heart. No way. It's impossible. You can't do that. Nobody's done that. Sub four minute mile can't be done. The mind many times sways the heart and bypasses the plan or the promise of God because the mind convinces the heart. No way. Don't even attempt it. Don't even try it. He staggered not at the promise of God, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Now, that's the faith part. I've taught on that before. The way to counter that, that, that tendency to stagger is to give glory to God, to praise God for the victory, to praise God for the healing, to praise God for the outcome before it happens. And being fully persuaded. Now, where was he persuaded? If I want to persuade you right now, I'm trying to persuade you to think differently. I'm trying to persuade you to think higher thoughts. I'm trying to persuade you to think like God. You might say, well, I don't know how God thinks. Just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You'll see how God thinks. Jesus came to show us how God thinks in humanity. Think God's thoughts. And so he staggered not, and he was fully persuaded. What was he fully persuaded of? That what God has promised was stronger than what he saw, what he heard. Now, eye has not seen, ears not heard. Why eye and ear? Because eye and ears, ears and eyes, are the primary data collectors of the mind. Yes, we collect data also by touch, but eyes and ears are the primary data collectors. And what we are to do is bypass that when it comes to things that can't be seen and can't be heard. That the Spirit would be the primary data collector. From the Holy Spirit, He shows us something something we've never done, never considered. We take hold of that. The mind begins to tell us, no way, you can't. No one else has, no one else does. You don't know anybody who did. Your mind will give you all kinds of reasons why not to even attempt it. If you never attempt it, you'll never do it. Your mind will say, don't attempt it because you're not going to do it. 
Well, if you don't try it, you're not going to do it. You must go for it in Jesus' name. Now, wrong thinking leads to wrong believing. Wrong thinking leads to wrong believing. Listen, before I was born again, I did not know about being born again. I sat in a church. I went to a parochial school. I never heard about being born again. So there's no way that my mind could even comprehend that because I didn't know that. After I got born again in Jerusalem, Israel, as an archaeologist, I did not know about the power of faith. I did not know how to pray in faith. I prayed prayers of desperation. I prayed prayers of, you know, need. But I was not praying in faith. And then I discovered the many teachers here in the States that would focus on faith and on overcoming and on the power of God. And I learned about faith. At the same time, learned about healing. I didn't need healing, but I learned about healing. Done at the cross. In my name you shall lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. By his wounds, by his stripes, we are made whole. Surely he carried our sickness and our disease, and by his wounds we're healed. So I learned about that. And 16 years ago, when the cancer came on my body, that's when I needed it. But I already had it. I already was thinking that. I saw miracles as we prayed for people. I saw it happen. But my thinking helped my believing. Now, when you read, when you read something in the Word of God, when you read something, it goes to the brain first. It would be nice if it would just go straight to the spirit, but it goes to the brain first. And your brain can filter it out or filter it. Have you ever put filters on your email so only certain emails come through? No, well, you can do that, you know, filter out a lot of the junk email. Well, we naturally put filters on our brain. Oh, that's Jesus. Oh, that's God. Oh, that's me. Oh, Jesus did that. Mm, that's me. Oh, that's what God does, but that's me. We filter out things so that we go around and what do we think of ourselves? We're just sinners saved by grace. Well, yes, that's true. But we don't live just as sinners saved by grace because we are to put on the righteousness of Christ. Because we're sinners saved by grace, we then put on the righteousness of Christ and we go forward to do combat in his name. We don't stay back there saying we're just, we're just you know, here, like, let's just keep a low profile. We're going to hold on to the rapture. We just hold on, just hold on. I know that devil's a big bad guy, beats us up all the time. But if we just hold on, no. No and no. Jesus said, in my name, you shall cast out devils. The word of God says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So we are not hunkering down in the bunker just until Jesus comes and sets us free. We've been set free. And we are to resist the enemy and submit to God and take upon ourselves the weapons of warfare. We're not weak and sickly. We're not weak and sickly. And if you are, stop thinking you are. Stop thinking that weak and sickly thoughts. We're armed and dangerous. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, not fleshly, not weak, but mighty through God to pull down those strongholds that the enemy puts up against us. So stop thinking weak and sickly thoughts. Stop thinking I'm just a poor sinner thoughts. You're no longer a poor sinner. You're the righteousness of Christ now. We're not unable and unworthy. We're just an unworthy worm for Jesus. No, you're not an unworthy worm. You're able to do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens us. He has called us out of darkness into light, out of the kingdom of this world into the kingdom of God. We've been changed and transformed. In fact, the word of God says we're a new creation. And that word means we're a new species. We're no longer homo sapien. And if anybody tells you you came from monkeys, no, not you, because you're a new species. They maybe, maybe came from monkeys, but you're a new species. You're something new. Evolution. Still waiting for the missing link. Some, one time I thought I met the missing link, actually, but no, it wasn't. We're waiting for the missing link. You're going to have a long wait for that missing link. doesn't exist. Anyway, I don't want to preach on that today. 
Let's go to, uh, well, I, I, you don't have to go. I'll just give you the scripture reference. Matthew 12, 34. Wrong thinking leads to a poor confession of faith. Now, one of the things, and, and uh, I mention this scripture a lot from Revelation, that the saints of God overcome the evil one by the blood of the Lamb, which we have, and the word of our testimony. See, the and means there's two things. The blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. A lot of people don't have a testimony. A lot of people, and I'm not saying about your testimony of salvation, your testimony of healing. I'm talking about what you say on a daily basis. That's what we talked about Thursday, your confession of faith, our confession of faith. Wrong thinking leads to a poor confession of faith. If we think small, we speak small. If we think weak, we, th we speak weak. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what's the problem there? Well, that's what's in the heart. We filtered everything through the mind and gets down to the heart. So we don't have much in there. All we have is weakness and we have inability and we have fear and we have doubt in the heart. Well, there's no way we're going to move mountains out of our lives like that. We've got to take the word of God and sow it into our hearts without filtering it. Too many people think, well, that's what the word of God says, but that's not what he means. You know, he doesn't really mean that. That's what he says. That's not, no, no. He means what he says. When the Lord says you can, you can. When the Lord says you are, you are. Don't filter it. Don't let the mind filter it. The word of God in Philippians, you can turn there with me. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And uh, in Philippians 4, verse 8, 1, 8, 1 verse, verse 8. Philippians 4, 8. You're, these are all scriptures we're familiar with. Finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Now, out of the contemporary English version, it says this, keep your minds on what is true. What's true? God's word is true. God's word is truer than circumstances of our lives. You know, if you are sick, and the word of God says, by whose stripes you are healed, you either believe God's word is being true or you believe your feelings is being true. If you believe God's word, you get healed. So whatsoever things are true, feelings are not true. Feel, you know, I can give you that. How many of you, when you were in fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, had an absolute crush on someone, and you imagine spending the rest of your life with them. You, were, you had this feeling, this feeling. And now, looking back on that, how many of you are like, thank you, Lord, that didn't happen? <laughs> Feelings change. Feelings are not always based in reality. God's word is truth. It's a truth that sets us free. Sets us free from what? From feelings, first of all, and from the circumstances of life. Look, not everybody has wonderful circumstances every day. There are a lot of really rotten circumstances that we go through, but that's the key. We go through. If you think you deserve them, you stay there. And you just set up your tent right there. And you live in those circumstances. That's your goal. That's your destination. But my Bible says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I'm not walking to it. I'm walking through it. You're coming out on the other side. And I don't just mean when you get to heaven. I mean the other side of that difficulty or that circumstance. So Philippians says, keep your minds on what's true. What's pure. What's pure. What's right. And today, more important than ever to keep your mind on what is right. What is right. Because there's a lot of wrong in the world today. A lot of wrong in our culture. And rather than get bogged down in the wrong, think about what is right. What is holy. What is friendly. What is proper. Don't stop thinking about what is truly worthwhile. This is the contemporary English version. I love that. Don't stop thinking about what is truly worthwhile. Our feelings will pass away. The circumstances will pass away. The problem people in our lives, unless they're saved, will pass away. But God's word 
will never pass away. That's worthwhile. That's something we can think about. Now, it doesn't mean that all we, we can think is God's literal biblical word. Yes, we should be meditating upon that. We should have that hidden in our hearts. We should be thinking about that, but put it into your own language. Think about the same things Jesus would think about. We have the mind of Christ, don't we? So if we have the mind of Christ, we should be anyway thinking about the things he would think about. And he never... Look, I love it when they come, you know, there's all these thousands of people. Now, the Bible says 5,000 men. So with the women and children, it could be 8, 10, 15,000 people there. And Jesus looks at the apostles and say, they, they say to him, we got to send everybody away. And Jesus says, you feed them. Now, what were the apostles thinking right then? Well, certainly not God's thoughts. The apostles were thinking, Jesus, what are you talking about? Well, how can we feed him? If all of us had a year's salary, 200 penny worth, a year's salary, we couldn't feed all these people. If all of us had a year's salary. So they were thinking of what they can't do. They were thinking of what they don't have. This is typical, what we think of. We think of our lack. Well, we can't do that. Oh, or we say it like this. Man, if I had a million dollars, you know what I would do? You'd give it to the church, I hope. So Jesus says, okay, well, what do we have? And they bring him, they say, well, you know, we have five loaves and two fish, but they add, it's nothing for all these people. I mean, in King James, but what are they among so many? Basically, it's nothing. Not enough. Not enough. How many of us are still thinking, not enough? We're not good enough. We don't love God enough. We don't pray enough. We don't go to church enough. That's true. We don't love God. Uh, that one, I'm going to agree with you. Got to be in church more. We, 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 don't, we didn't study in seminary. We, didn't, we, we don't have, we don't, if we only knew somebody who would open that door, we'd get that door opened. We know the one who opens doors. So we think about all these, these things we don't have. Jesus said, what do you have? He's not interested in what we don't have. He wants to know what we believe we have, what we think we have. That's all he needs to work with. He says, okay, five loaves, two fish, great, make them sit down. So the apostles, I'm sure they're like, oh boy, we're going to see something going on. We're going to see this great miracle now. And Jesus takes the five loaves, two fish, he lifts them up to heaven and prays, and then he looks at the boys. He gives it to them. Now you feed them. Not only did Jesus see enough in five loaves and two fish, he saw enough in them that they could pull this off. That they wouldn't say, you got to be kidding me. That's not enough for the front row. They actually did what he said. They turned around and they fed the front row and then they're like, wait a minute. They're like 30 people and they all ate and I still have five loaves and two fish. So they fed the next row and the next row. They acted on the word. They changed their thinking. We need to change our thinking. How do we do that? 2 Corinthians 10, 5. You don't need to turn. Bringing every thought to the captivity of Christ. We don't allow our thoughts to think negative thoughts, lack thoughts, sickly thoughts, weak thoughts, or even pseudo-spiritual thoughts. I'm just an poor, unfortunate worm for Jesus. That sounds holy. How strongly should I say it? But it's dumb. I, I, I went, I went mid-road. Mid it's not holy. Before you came to the altar and accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you are an unfortunate sinner. Once you got Christ in you, the hope of glory, once you had the spirit of life in you, you are now a new creation, as I said earlier. You are the righteousness of Christ. You put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You're weaponed, you're weaponized, you're armed, you're dangerous, you're able, you're strong in the Lord and the power of his might. You overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. You triumph in all things, and you are called more than a conqueror. That's who we are right now. It doesn't matter what the devil says, what your neighbor says, what your husband or wife says. It doesn't matter what your what anybody says or what other church people say, you are who God says you are. We are who the Word of God says we are. We've got to start thinking that. And as we think it, that's who we become.